And I think open source hardware is a great idea because that also gets around these these problems with sanctions or, you know, if I if I actually talked to a guy from Turkey and I, I was talking about the Goten mesh and I was like, can we get you some of these Goten meshes? And he said, no, you really can't because every piece of communication hardware that comes into Turkey is authorized by a special agency and they don't allow peer-to-peer -peer communication. It's um, so that's where I open hardware is pretty important. Um, but, but, you know, yeah, so let's Let's send a bunch of uh, Turpil devices there. We can send a drone <laughs> next to the builder, like we are planning to do in Venezuela too. You just send them with a, a lot of them. globes, yeah. so that they just drop them there. Yeah, yeah. You, we can or, or, we can do that. We can put a small balloon and let them just fly uh, the farthest you can, and then yes, now we're so we just need to get it and, and get it blocked. Yeah. That's yeah. that's that how that's how we are going to do in Venezuela. I don't I don't have any intention of, talk, of talking to the regulators there to get the devices to allow the devices to go Yourself, in. I are have my own welding them. You will be able to do it because we are going to open source the way that uh, you can build your own to build devices yeah, too. So we're, I mean we're we've built our hardware, so we're not looking for money for that. We're really just looking for people to help contribute to the open source software, either as a developer or as a tester or somebody to give us feedback on the application. So, um, and when you're in a, you know, a crowded situation, they could use it, but um, there's no way a, a Bluetooth mesh network could have really caught on. But what, the thing that Randy is working on and what I'm working on have like in the, in, the in the sort of realm of kilometers of range, which means that for a city, you can actually build a connected, a fully connected mesh network with a fairly low number. I mean, anyway, that's why I think my the zero start problem is the problem I'm, is I think a very fundamental problem, and that's how do you get people to run them? Because it, once you get a lot of people running them, the network is useful and people want to run them. It's when it's early and people aren't running them, you need to kind of bootstrap that network to get that critical mass so that people can turn it on and actually get a message across. It's again so, coming back to an educational problem, <laughs> like in Bitcoin. Like. Hey, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. How are you guys doing? You know, uh, there's 8 billion people on this planet. And, uh, you know, once we achieve total freedom from these, you know, fascist, dictatorial, uh, authoritative regimes, um, the central banks, the governments, all these centralized institutions, you know, finally free ourselves from the censorship, from the surveillance, from you know every oppressive measure you can think of so i have a really special episode coming up with richard myers of global mesh labs alessandro cesare of coinspre and randy brito of loja mesh i'm going to talk about tons of things but mainly it's about you know how can we um, uh, make bitcoin transactions independent from the power grid and the internet and the technology is being developed uh, you know, with Richard Myers uh, from Global Mesh Labs and Brandy Brito of Locha Mesh. We're going to talk about you know, lightning networks, censorship resistant money, mesh networks, local mesh networks, long range radio communications, payments without internet. Uh, we're going to talk about you know, Locha Mesh Global, uh, and, and um, Global Mesh Labs. We're going to talk about IPv6, full nodes. You know, I'm not technical, but there's a lot of you know, like understanding the bigger picture is really important. So without further ado, really excited for this talk. And if you like this, um, please let me know your questions afterwards and please like it, share it, retweet it, especially to people who can, you know, help us uh, further and accelerate and facilitate this technology even faster. So thank you so much for supporting, for listening and here you go. Hello, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevin Davani, also the host of the Total Connector Show. I'm really pleased and excited to uh, welcome my very special guest. It's a very special episode, um, which we're going to talk about why. But first of all, I just want to give, um, um, first of all, welcome uh, Richard, uh, Randy, and Alessandro. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Great. Looking forward to it. All right, so I'll just, uh, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself a little bit, but um, maybe for my listen, I'm just gonna, you know, uh, sort of a quick summary. Um, Randy Brito, you know, is at Locha Mesh, and it's a great, uh, you know, project. Uh, you know, they also work with open source projects. Um, op and 
uh, it's about you know communicating just simply in plain language, chatting and sending Bitcoin without the internet, communicating mm -hmm. with others off grid, broadcasting Bitcoin, syncing your full node. Uh, and um, uh, since the last time we talked to one another, uh, Randy has also developed a Turpel device, which um, I'm sure he's gonna you know go into detail. It's a, a magic. Uh, mesh hardware, you know, Turpil is a portable hotspot which connects you to the Lacho Mesh to use Bitcoin. Uh, Richard Myers at Global Mesh Labs, and um, it's about you know peer-to-peer -peer messaging network. It's uh, he also you know they also developed the Lot Forty Nine protocol, which builds on technology developed for the Bitcoin Lightning network to drive mesh network adoption by incentivizing coverage and capacity where and when it is needed. And Alexandro Cesare, uh, we just talked yesterday. It was great to have him back again. He's the CEO of, uh, and co-founder of Coinspree. Uh, it's about you know Bitcoin-related financial uh, services, storing large quantities of Bitcoins for the long term using cold storage and multisig, and managing your own institutional digital wallet and becoming a crypto bank or a Bitcoin bank. Uh, again, gentlemen, thank you so much for coming. Um, uh, why don't you still, you know, uh, would ask you. Uh, maybe a few, you know, few words. Introduce yourself, your background, what has been developing lately since the last time. You know, we talked to one, especially Richard and Randy. Which I think it's been a while since we talked to one another. So, uh, yeah, Richard, uh, why don't you go ahead and welcome to the show? Thanks. Um, yeah. So, like you said, I, I work for Global Mesh Labs, and Global Mesh Labs is really an initiative out of a company called Gotenna, which makes um, the world's first consumer mobile mesh devices. Um, and we'll probably get more into definitions of what that means. But um, so what, what Global Mesh Labs was established to do was to basically create open source software to enable incentivized mesh networks. So the idea being that um, people who relay for other people on a mesh network or people who act as gateways to the internet could collect small payments. And in this case, um, this Lot 49 protocol you mentioned is essentially just a version of Lightning. It isn't a new token, it isn't really even a new protocol, it's really just lightning, but <clears throat> with some tweaks to make it work better over the low bandwidth, long range radio network. So that could be mesh networks, that could also be satellite networks, it could be um, even like ham radio we've done some experiments with. So that's really in a nutshell how Lot 49 is different than lightning. Um, so yeah, so that's what I'm working on. It's all open source. I mean, our hardware is a consumer device, but our initiative from a software standpoint is all open source and built on open source. So. Uh, that uh, Great. should be pretty exciting. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Uh, Randy, why don't you introduce yourself? <clears throat> um, well, I co-founded uh, Locha Mesh, which is a non-for-profit uh, organization uh, for developing an open source software and open source hardware guides, uh, guidelines on how to make um, a mobile first peer-to-peer -peer communication network uh, that is uh, resilient enough and decentralized enough of to circumvent blockades, and it's also capable of transacting not only Bitcoin transaction but also to sync your full node. Uh, we created a company that is going to develop the first device, which is the uh, Turpil device, that is based on these open source software and open source hardware guidelines that anyone can will be able to use to if they want to develop their own devices too. And we are going to uh, start selling the Turpil devices and also uh, making uh, it public for everyone to make their own um, early 2021. Great, thanks so much. Alessandro, um, um, you are the, you know, the, uh, one of the founders of Coinspree, and you also developed uh, uh, a full node, which, which looks like a really artful design. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, why don't you go ahead and uh, tell a little bit, my listeners, you know, where you come from, what's your background? Yeah, so been a Bitcoiner, a Bitcoin maximalist for seven for the past seven years now already. Uh, built one of the biggest Bitcoin mines inside Venezuela as well. Helped lots of friends and and families and, and family members to run their own like you know, uh, mining operations. That's how it started in Bitcoin. Um, but then in 2017, you're correct, Kivan, that's when I really wanted to double down, triple down actually on uh, my Bitcoin knowledge, my Bitcoin expertise, wanting to institutionalize uh, 
basically my my own Bitcoin venture, right? And so that's why I founded Coinspree. Uh, initially, it started with only private capital, but since last year, we are officially a Swiss legally based company. Uh, after securing some funding, enough funding to incorporate ourselves inside the canton of Zug in Switzerland. And yeah, you got the right. Uh, we are the creators of the Pandora Box Bitcoin full node. Uh, I think, I do believe it's the most artistical Bitcoin full node of the market. That entices people that actually don't know anything uh, about Bitcoin, right? Uh, especially bankers, <laughs> for example. Uh, and yeah, I mentioned specifically bankers because Coinspree is, is the only company providing sovereign financial services and sovereign financial custodian solutions uh, built on top of Bitcoin inside the Venezuela banking and finance sector. And so we have been the only project uh, 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 approach that has approached different banking entities, even the Venezuelan stock market and uh, the Venezuelan regulator Sunacrip, uh, helping, them, helping them understand and, you know, like foster this acculturation process uh, that is already undergoing the Venezuelan banking and finance sector that we, we are believe and we believe in the, we are, we are one of the few advocates that understand that the Venezuelan banking and finance sector will eventually be reconnected with the global economy through Bitcoin. That will be the, the main bridge. And so, yeah, mainly offering Bitcoin custodian solutions inside LATAM. Thank you. All right. Um, you know, there are 8 billion people um, on this planet and there's obviously a need for for this this super important technology that you guys are developing. Um, uh, you know, and uh, Randy, you know, um, there are pro 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 approximately like two and a half billion people sort of, they call them unbanked or, you know, they don't have access to financial, uh, you know, uh, uh, technologies or, you know, for sending, receiving. Um, let's just first clarify what would you, from your perspective, uh, Randy, for who, uh, what is your vision? Like, for who is this technology built? Like, is this for people primarily in countries like, you know, where are the sh sanctions, you know, surveillance, censorship, or is that more, uh, you know, on a global level? Well, the idea of the law challenge comes from what, how you can pay others and communicate with others. When there is when there is not service at all. So if you don't have internet, you don't have phones, you don't have electricity at all. Like in Venezuela, happened a couple of years ago and continue happening these past few months where the, the uh, power grid uh, fails every day it. for several hours. Yeah, you can certify that. <laughs> and the thing is that the, the how can you continue doing trades? How you, can you continue doing commerce? when there is no service at all. Because after a few days of no electricity, even cell towers stop working. So even if you manage to charge your phone uh, with battery, with a power generator or with your car, you won't be able to make any communi uh, communicate with anyone or make any transaction. Bank Online banking doesn't work if there is no electricity in the whole country. So how can you continue doing commerce? And that's where Bitcoin comes in because Bitcoin doesn't need all these uh, apparatus to, to work, but it does need something. It needs a medium of communication that is capable and resilient enough to continue working in this worst case scenario, which, uh, well, sadly, uh, the life example of, of this worst case scenario is Venezuela. So the idea comes from there. Um, it, it is how can you make payments in Bitcoin without internet or even electricity power grid at all? And this is what we focus on the past uh, two years. And the idea is to make a portable uh, battery-based uh, low-power uh, device that you can carry around with you and you can use as an antenna, a smart antenna that can talk to others to create a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized mesh network, which enables you to transmit not only short messages or text, but also Bitcoin transaction and even sync your Bitcoin full node without uh, any other uh, communication system. So you don't have to rely on the internet infrastructure. You don't have to rely on the 3G uh, mobile uh, data network. You don't have to use fiber cables. You don't have to use anything of this. You only need your device and you only need this device to be always on in order to be able to relay messages uh, and data for others. And 
it's capable of running in, in, a, in, in a small solar power uh, powered panel. So the idea is that you can carry it around instead of uh, having it uh, plugged in your house and not being able to communicate when you are on the go, for example. And so the idea is that you will connect this device with uh, your smartphone where you have your Bitcoin wallet, your Electron wallet, for example, and it's going to uh, use all their nodes inside the Locha Mesh to, for example, uh, relay a Bitcoin transaction that you have signed offline in your phone or sync your Electron wallet because inside the Locha Mesh there is another uh, node which is running the uh, Electron server or you are going to be able to reach somewhere inside the Locha Mesh uh, gateway that connects you to the internet to push a transaction to the Bitcoin network or to a miner or, or a pool. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I think people need to understand how structurally transformative this, this technology can be once it is, well, can be deployed, is, de is deployable, um, you know, on, on, you know, on, on a grand scale. Uh, Richard, I mean, what are, what are the challenges here? Uh, or what are the problems, the challenges? Uh, and can there be synergies created between, you know, you guys or, you know, whatever you, you know, your projects? Yeah, I mean, what Randy is working on is actually very uh, synergistic with what we're doing. I mean, we're just basically taking it, we're taking more of a focus on the software and the protocol side. Um, they're taking more of a focus on open sourcing the hardware because, you know, that's actually very important to have other options. So, the protocols are, are going to be hardware agnostic. What's really important is, though, that they that they um, that they are based on the same foundation, which in both of our case, all of our cases, is going to be Bitcoin, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but there are challenges and, and and some advantages over even traditional payment systems. I mean, if you're using a Visa card, it really has to phone home to, in order to make a safe payment, because how else does your payment provider know that um, you just used a valid credit card? So if the power goes out at a place like Venezuela, I mean, credit cards aren't going to be very useful or bank cards, debit cards, whatever people use. Um, and so in a way, uh, if you're making payments with Lightning, um, you have this advantage that you don't need, you still need the internet because obviously everything has to eventually get settled on the internet. But Lightning introduces the idea of a window of time. So once you've anchored your payment channels um, in something like Lok Jamesh or, or the, you know, using a Goten or however you're, however you're communicating with the nodes, um, you can negotiate just one on one, and that that's a really important distinction from Bitcoin payments versus Lightning payments. Because with a Lightning payment, you really need synchronous communication with the internet. You have got to go through a gateway to the internet, or a gateway to um, maybe a satellite dish, but still, eventually, it has to reach your transaction has to reach the internet. But with Lightning, that only has to happen at the beginning of a channel, and then you can continue to make payments over that channel even with no internet, even if you're totally isolated. As long as within some window of time, um, you're able to then check and make sure that that basically nobody's tried to breach your channel. Um, and if they have, there's a penalty. So there's 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 incentives for people not to breach, but um, you can programmatically set that. And I think currently even Lightning wallets now are, have about a week, I believe, something like a week, um, where you could continue to make payments without any touching of the internet. Uh, and then you just and then you just have to go on the internet to verify that 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 um, channel is open. And if it is still valid, you don't have to go touch the internet anymore. So it's actually not even a, it's not even that you have to get something to the internet. You can just have a passive receiver like the Blockstream satellite. And as long as your channels don't get breached, you can continue to make these payments. Um, so it's very it's a very exciting protocol, and I think it's a little bit over uh, sort of underappreciated when people talk about Lightning. I mean, it's obviously got other advantages. You can make rapid payments. It's private. A lot of other things, but um, I think it's got a very special place for off-grid. Um, but the challenge is that you do eventually need to get on-grid. So I think most yeah. of the cha mm -hmm. challenges are to do with those setting up of channels and and checking, uh, like for breach transactions. So yeah, do I, that in a I would like to way. add something. Yeah, I please. would like to add something to what you say. Is uh, in in the example of in this case Venezuela or uh, Iran, Turkey, Russia that has been completely disconnected from the internet once already that we know. Um, what, once you have this isolated network inside a country, you can continue receiving the blocks information from the satellite if you have satellite dish. The thing is that if you get that information from the, uh, from the satellite, like the blocks satellite, satellite, um, that it's beaming that information into the, uh, to the earth, the thing is, you will you will receive it 
for yourself. You won't be able to share this information with others because no one else has the same uh, setup as you do, or no one has Wi-Fi, which connects one house with another with high speed um, connection of, of antennas, um, like very big antenna that connect to each other over like one gigabyte connections, right? So the thing is, is in, in a, this uh, situation where there is an isolated country or isolated city, like happened in Venezuela when there is no uh, uh, internet, the electricity for several days, the, the cell tower also stopped working. So the, there is no communication between one city and another. In this isolated uh, city, you will still be able to use the line and network because you already have the payment channels open with that person, like the butcher or, or or the store next to your house. The thing is you won't be able to tell if this person does have access to the internet and is trying to cheat on you. Th that's why we uh, take this approach of making uh, several small devices affordable enough for everyone to have one in their houses. And it's not a very difficult setup. It's only uh, a small device that you carry with, with you and you connect to it over Wi-Fi, so you can connect up to four devices, four mobile phones to it, so it's affordable for a family to have one, like the router in the house. So the, the thing is that these devices will enable you to connect to everyone around you and even reach more people uh, through hubs over the, the mesh, that it somehow will let you get information even if you are not connected to the internet. Like, if there is a coin spree full node connected to a, a, a satellite dish and it's, and it's getting this information of the blocks, you will be able to get this information from your neighbors. So, and you will be able to share it with other. And in this way, you will be able to tell, for example, the latest blocks, if you've been cheated by the, uh, the grocery store next to your house. So in this, this is something that is needed because if you need, uh, internet or at least right now you need internet to be able to make Bitcoin payments because you have to reach uh, somehow a pool where your transaction will be mined. Um, in the Lightning Network, you still need to be able to tell if your channel is still operatable or is being uh, uh, shut down by the other party. So this is why we think that the always on connected to this uh, mesh network is very important, which bring us to, we also we will also need to have full nodes running inside the Lodge Mesh, like the ones uh, uh, Alejandro Alessandro is, is working on, because those also will also be need to be service providers, like uh, electron server provider or gateway provider to the internet or satellite uh, information, data information from the blocks. Um, or even the, the using the satellite uh, communication system to, to be able to penetrate messages from outside the country. Can I ask you, um, let's just look at it from a practical, uh, Alessandro, have you tested the Turpial device? I mean, is there some kind of pilot project going on in Venezuela? <laughs> I, I have not tested the devices yet, but I, I'm up to testing them. And actually, before I leave the country or whatever, I do plan on leaving part of my Bitcoin full notes connected to a Locha Mesh. Because uh, I believe that, frankly, and this is only my humble opinion, uh, in the community, we need to do more low to mesh and less block stream <laughs> uh, because mesh networks are a thing and will eventually be a thing. Okay, a bit, a, a huge thing. Uh, we see we see the projects coming from Richard, and then we also have Tourmaline Wireless in the U.S. Right, and then the Helium Helium networks with their own token, like trying to tokenize mesh networks, which I think it's it's hugely important that we, we that we try to like integrate well, at least at Losha, Helium, and those sort of projects, integrate monetization services for people that run their own like Locha Mesh device and sort of receive some interest rate uh, because they're running that device. Uh, uh, I think that uh, we also need to like foster, like, like really understand what is the actual infrastructure that we can leverage inside Venezuela for Locha, to uh, like uh, be widely adopted as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. Part of the part part of that being people inside the community or the Satoshi in Venezuela group that are uh, capable enough to have uh, enough resources, right, to run their own Bitcoin full node. Because in this part of the world, people are living hand to mouth. That's reality. Ninety six percent of 
people inside Venezuela are living in poverty. Uh, but the great thing about projects like Losha is that with a low cost entry barrier device, you will be able to provide ex like extensive coverage nationwide uh, with very few number, uh, with a very uh, number, uh, uh, with a very few number of devices, right? Uh, so that's that's important. I mean, if this cost is with Randy, like with a couple of four or five, eight hundred to all, all the way up to twelve hundred dollars setups, uh, you could basically cover all of uh, the capital inside Venezuela, Caracas, with four, mm -hmm. four or five of those setups. So you're literally creating a new financial telecommunications infrastructure based on like what ten thousand dollars what this is, is that fantastic man? <laughs> yeah and, have and, you tried and, and, yeah. wish wish yeah wish we had ten thousand dollars for the uh, venezuela <laughs> the caracas pilot that would that would help and, us a lot <laughs> and so that, that's that's when we need to stress like stress like give a hundred thousand dollars to these people man give yeah. half a million dollars to the people <laughs> at locha for them yeah. to continue innovating and fostering because in the end look it's good it's, it's going 100% to the development. So it's, it's okay if every, anyone wants help that. I mean, yeah. so like in the end, Venezuela is the, is, is the most hyper Bitcoinized uh, country at a per capita level in the world. You can be frank. Yeah, potentially, yeah. And, and so we're, we are like literally the perfect setup and the perfect environment for testing Losha. And so that's all that people need to see. It's, a, it's not only about mesh networks, it's the brilliant use cases that will come out of that. Because when you're literally well, it's, it's, disconnected- It's also the, the, the best place for testing Bitcoin in their uh, fundamentals. Uh, if, is it actually going to be the hardest money ever made? Is it going to be actually unconfiscatable? Well, it's, it is not unconfiscatable if it has to run on the centralized uh, Canteve internet that is in the country or they run at uh, Russian uh, internet controlled by the government. So it does need to be running in a decentralized censorship resistant communication network. If, if not, it is currently only a permission to use Bitcoin from those uh, in, in power. Uh, it, I think it needs to be uh, actually uh, a liberation tool in that way that I will actually be uh, free to use it uh, without asking for permission, like uh, mon money without master that it's supposed to be. Yeah, I think you mentioned, uh, you know, not being, sen being censorship resistant. Part of that is also the interesting aspect of Mesh is that it adds a whole layer of privacy. Um, and if you don't have privacy, if even if you are uncensorable, but you're monitored, then yeah. you're really not free because like in Iran. You know, it, yeah, yeah, like in Iran, if you're if you're if they know every transaction you make, maybe they don't know the amounts even, but if they know the if they know you're making those transactions and where you're located, because they know your IP address, you paid for that, you have to subscribe to that, um, then you you sort of lose that any freedom you might have from Bitcoin could potentially be taken away, even in a place like you know the United States or Europe. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk now about monitoring transactions and having this sort of, uh, what do they call it, the travel rule? Where travel, data travel, yeah. travel rule between, you know, that, that really is a direct attack on the, on the self-sovereignty of Bitcoin. So technologies like Mesh are really powerful because you create your own ID, you create your own IP address, essentially. So you're not going to a central ISP giving your passport or giving your, you know, your, your home address in order to get on the network. And I think that's a really, a really powerful thing. And Obviously, in Europe, we're not, you know, we're not as far along as it is in Venezuela, but I could see if you were a miner, for example, and you were trying to keep what you were doing a little low key, uh, perhaps mesh is a good way to do that. I mean, it's not very much data you got to, you know, you got to transmit. You just have to get that block hash out there. So, um, yeah, I, I think that you're, you're very, it's very, I mean, I really love what you guys are doing in Venezuela because uh, the need is so great and you're, you know, you're, you're basically tackling it. Um, I just wanted to respond to a couple of things that uh, Alessandro said too. You talked about incentivization, and I'm and I'm really curious to get you know Randy and Alessandro's feedback on how that could work if you're using Lightning, for example, over these mesh networks, because that's one of the premises of what we're doing with Lot 49 is that people will be incentivized to run these always-on nodes, like Randy was talking about, because as they relay transactions or information. Um, they'll get a small Bitcoin payment. You know, they'll, they'll just like the normal Lightning Network, anybody who is a relay is also going to get a payment. 
um, or if you're running a gateway. So if you have a Blockstream satellite or you have some internet connection that you're using, um, if you can get um, Lightning payments for that, if you can basically get the relay payment that is already built into Lightning for running those. I'm curious yeah. to hear what you guys have to think about that. Well, the idea of the Lightning uh, hubs that currently get paid for relaying payments. And we thought about that in 2018. I mean, we ran the numbers and it didn't add up enough. So uh, we thought, for example, that uh, uh, places where people have the uh, point of sale, they have to have internet because they have to be able to make uh, bank transactions with cards. So we thought about the, they selling that internet access through uh, these large mesh devices because you are already connected to the large mesh. You will just need to like open this uh, share uh, internet bandwidth, right? And you will be paid for that. And the thing is that uh, the way that you will get paid that small uh, amount of bandwidth that you're going to sell, the best way was the the Lightning Network. As this uh, the places has internet, the idea is they will have uh, full node with uh, LND or, or C Lightning on them, and and then uh, cre uh, uh, create a, a payment channel with clients that usually go there because they uh, they are neighbors basically. So they will be able to pay to that place every day, not only for the things they are buying, but also for the bandwidth they are being sold by this service provider. The thing is that uh, the uh, fees that the um, operator will collect for uh, lining network relay payments will be, uh, won't be enough to maintain the operation. The internet is expensive in Venezuela. So the places where the internet is less accessible and there are less companies competing, obviously it's the most, the most expensive one. So the, the things that we thought more about these places offering a service, this service is the one that they're going to charge. For example, access to uh, Bitcoin push uh, service so they can push transaction that user has uh, signed offline um, or access to an electron server so they can sign, sync their wallet and actually use them um, without having to sign offline but actually getting the lattice balance so they, they will be able to make transactions just like they are currently connected to the internet which is the future idea is that you will have all these nodes all these pools and miners and everyone running in the same mesh network, even if they have to go through some breaches and so uh, gateways to, to talk to each other, which is possible with the protocol we are uh, building, which is based on IPv6, it has a full, full IPv6 support. So every service, uh, web server, and, and even the, um, and all, all other nodes for other cryptocurrencies, uh, currently work. You, you just set up your computer server or, or, or Raspberry Pi to also listen to this IPv6 uh, address that you have made out of thin air and you don't have to, to get it uh, registered anywhere. It's not connected to your ID. It's not connected to your to your face. You are not uh, face scanned for these services. You basically connect, uh, add it as a device, like a network device to your computer and it lets you connect to others. So that's this way you will be able to offer the services to others and get paid for that. And you will be pay, get paid uh, as you're working as a gateway uh, with Bitcoin on the on, on chain or Lightning because you also have a, a full node connected or you have access to the lattice blocks or even RPC pay from the Monero uh, community, we, uh, which I think is very interesting the way they are doing it. Yeah, they are using basically CPU cycles, so it's like everyone will be able to use it, e even if it's only to pay for access for a small uh, data to just reach the internet in the early days. I think it's a, a very cool way to do it. If even if you don't, you are not using uh, other cryptocurrencies. I think that the power of your devices that you have already bought, it's a good way to uh, amortize them, to, to make a use of them. And if it's going to pay for your Bitcoin to go through, I think that's a pretty cool service. Interesting, yeah. Well, it's a, it's a little bit different. I mean, we're, we're also you know, thinking about what you're saying there about, you could have gateways charging for services. Like you said, you could have them serve, serve as a 
Electrum server or something like that. So that that's that certainly makes a lot of sense. But um, we're thinking from our mesh network, you really have this problem sometimes that you know people have limited battery life on their phone and also on their device. And if you allow them to earn even just micro payments for relaying data over the Lightning network, that that you know could be enough incentive for them to keep a device running where they might not otherwise keep it on. But I think it's a, you know it's an empirical question. We'll have to just see how excited people are. Um, Alessandro mentioned the Helium network, which I, I'm not too in favor of. I mean, I don't think their technology is very sound, and it's not a mesh network. It's more Star and Agreed. Spoken Hub. But, but they've actually got generated a lot of excitement over just the idea of earning money for relaying data. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I do mm -hmm. think there's a demand for that. Now, you know, maybe you know, we'll see you know, how long that lasts, but um, I, do, I would really like to see that excitement directed to something a little more solid like the Lightning Network. And uh, I think people, I mean, I know I've run a lightning network and not really made a lot of money on it, but there's a, there's a certain excitement to seeing those, you know, millisats coming in. So <laughs> I yeah. think at least initially among Bitcoiners, I think there's going to be some interest in, in running relay nodes and, and, being, and being paid, you know, for, for relaying and also for being broadcast, you know, for being a communication relay as well as a, a, a financial relay. Um, but uh, but I, I was interested in hearing your thoughts on that, mostly because you know, it's really more of a hobby in places like Europe right now. And in, but in places like Venezuela, it could actually be, you know, well, it, it's more substantial. So, yeah, well, the, the, the thing is that the, the amount of money that you can collect for just relaying messages or just providing this relay messages data uh, over the Lucha Mesh, for example, is going, it's not going to be enough for you to, uh, I mean, to, for example, have a computer connected to the uh, blockchain satellite with a uh, satellite digit that you have to invest on and, and mm -hmm. all the, the parts that you have to put there. But uh, what we are building in Lochamish, the protocol that we are building, um, enables you to let uh, network, like network devices talk to each other um, in different ways. So the things that we currently use radio in the 9-1500, uh, 915 megahertz uh, mm -hmm. band and at the 868 in Europe. But we do this because it's a low power, long range distance uh, band uh, devices that we, we can use uh, in, on battery. But the thing is that with the protocol that we are building, you will be able to connect like high speed uh, devices, also high speed uh, antennas for connecting devices to, and they will be able to talk using the same protocol. So they are going to communicate and handshake and, um, and relay messages and find others, for example, over Wi-Fi, which is less distance, but you have more bandwidth. So you can do 200 me me uh, megabits per second or, or even one gigabit per second if it's a good device. The thing is that you, you will be able to uh, make a mesh of real devices not only the portable ones that won't talk to others, but they will be able to talk to, to all the devices in other uh, communication methods, like even cable. Even if, if you if you have a, a LAN network, these devices will, uh, if, if you don't set up them to talk to each other, they actually don't know they are in the same network. So the thing is that if, if you have this uh, protocol that we are building, they are going to be able to find each other and, and, and coordinate the communication between them to, for example, relay a message to one device that is even in a different network like radio. So the, the, the idea of this is that you will be able to like handshake with someone and these devices are, are, are uh, the small devices are going to, to communicate with each other in long distance, but they will be able to try themselves to, for example, uh, okay, I'm going to try over Wi-Fi now to see if you are a neighbor uh, close to me, so we can talk to over that other network, which enables uh, like a higher being bandwidth between us, and so we I can share with you like the whole Bitcoin uh, blockchain from Genesis block over that uh, other Wi-Fi. So this this uh, this is going to to also uh, enable this mesh network of real devices talking to each other to do more things than just chatting. Um, we we believe this is important because it it might look as a hobby outside places like Venezuela or Iran, but it's going to be needed in any other place if you want to be able to trade uh, or you want to be able to communicate uh, privately and securely. For 
the one of the example is here in in Spain when uh, uh, last year they uh, started uh, looking up um, who is saying what on the internet just to try to uh, uh, send the message of what the government was doing about this uh, situation with the COVID. So now they basically want to be able to uh, use uh, WhatsApp, Telegram, and to send emergency messages. So they want to be able to communicate over, uh, to, to send messages uh, over this private communication system, which are supposed to be uh, outside the reach of the government. They want to be able to co to to even send messages there or find out who is talking about what. So the thing is, is it might look as a hobby right now in these, uh, um, in, in other countries outside these authoritarian ones, which are pretty clear and you can see them from outside in, um, and you can tell they are authoritarian, but it's going to be needed in other places if you want to be able to communicate uh, freely. And the thing, one, one of the samples now is I, I don't like the power that, for example, the U.S. government has to uh, locate people who are uh, against them. In, in, and I don't like that power, um, even if it's going against people I don't like. And, and the thing is that I, I, I don't like it because once they get in power, they will have all those tools to track me down, too. And, and so I the prefer power. that that's... Yeah against me. So I prefer the power to be as decentralized as possible and with a mesh network you can do that. And if you are not able to track down someone because you are not able to mine that person's information through uh, his, uh, this, this person ID document or by checking uh, internet provider because that person signed up to that internet service or, or a burn fund that currently are allowed to use, they let you, they give you the permission to continue using it because they know how to track it down and they know, they, they at least can listen to the conversation, even if they don't know who they are, like uh, Richard said before, they can't see what you are transacting or what amount you are transacting or who you are transacting with, but they know you are transacting because you are in a network for transactions. The idea of the mesh network is that is going to enable computers to talk to each other, people chat, send messages, images, everything is going to be uh, encrypted from the user and, uh, and, the, recipi and the recipient um, in, a, in the application layer. So the thing that you won't be able to tell if it's a Bitcoin transaction or is uh, an electron server communicating with an electron user, or you won't be able to tell even if I'm just uh, messaging with uh, someone. And that's better than how the internet currently works, that it's been uh, snooped on and everyone can see what is actually happening if they have enough power to control the whole network like in Venezuela and Russia, or just have enough power to get the companies, the communication company and the telecom companies to tell them what they need. What about Blockstream? I mean, how come, is that is that like relevant? The Blockstream uh, um, satellite kit that they've been working on is that something that could facilitate, uh, you know, this process? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's an important component. It's just one tool. You you wouldn't probably want to rely all the time on yeah. one Blockstream because, of course, they could be they could be compromised. You know, they they somebody even if you trust Blockstream, you don't know who's in the chain of communication that you know, in a, in a really adversarial situation. Um, but the nice thing about having mesh and block stream is you might get, you might, like, let's say you're looking at something called block headers. So block headers are how you kind of keep, make sure you're on the honest blockchain. Um, if you're getting those from the block stream satellite, that's one source of information, but you could also be getting it over the mesh network through a gateway. It's very, it's very small data, it's 80 bytes. So you can just, you, even if you're getting your blocks off the block stream satellite, which is actually fairly high bandwidth, as long as you're able to use something like mesh or, or sort of alternative communication methods to get those very small block headers, it gives you this sort of double check that you're still following the correct chain. You're following the correct blockchain. Um, and I, I actually wanted to mention, I think there's a real big place here for things like amateur radio too. Amateur radio is a like the original mesh network. I mean, those guys have been doing it for a long time. And um, it's a little co-opted, at least, you know, in a lot of the sort of developed countries, it's kind of co-opted by the government, they say what you can and what you can't do. But 
the technology itself is very powerful. It's like, you know, if you imagine these mesh networks, but then you, you run them at 100 watts or 200 watts. Now you're not just talking within one city, you're talking between cities. So you could have uh -huh. a couple of amateur radios that are bridging your cities to give you a fully national network. So I think it's all, you know, going to be built on a hierarchy like that. Um, so I don't know, is there a community, a big community of amateur radio people in Venezuela? I'm, I'm curious if you talked to any of those people. <laughs> no, not not really. I I believe. I don't know if Randy knows about it. I think I think there there's no one uh, related to that inside mm -hmm. of Venezuela right now. Uh, but what I wanted to bring to the table, guys, uh, listening to you, Randy, and listening to Richard as well, uh, because you know, uh, Coinspire has more of an institutional background than an end consumer background and based business model, right? Uh, eventually, I believe that I wanted to bring two main things to the table. Uh, one is really related to like Locha and the Bitcoin Venezuelan environment. Uh, me specifically talking to the regulator, uh, probably more often than Randy because Randy is outside the country. Uh, even the telecommunications industry is controlled by the government inside Venezuela. So to a certain degree, they want to know and everything and anything that happens right inside inside the country. Uh, just like in Russia, for example, or, or even India, right? And there are 1.3 billion people. So, uh, but, but of course, this will start as a cypherpunk move still, right? It is, we're still barely, very early ages on this. But what I, what I like about Locha is that, look, there's a Venezuelan company, right? That is called Viqua. Viqua is based on what you, what you were saying right now, Richard, which is basically smart cities, smart cities, right? connecting cities through a different network and a different uh, co communication grid, grid, correct? And so uh, Viqua is one of, uh, they've even been mentioned by Forbes. Viqua has done several uh, state level uh, uh, businesses and projects throughout Latin America, like for example, in Venezuela to automate traffic lights, et cetera, and in Colombia and Panama. And so uh, I, I, I told the CEO of Viqua, which I know him, I told him like, dude, you're not a smart cities company anymore if you're not dealing with smart money. <laughs> and, if you're not, and if you're not talking to Randy Brito from Lodge and Mesh, you're totally missing the point, man. Because I, I, I've tried to envision like the institutional, the institutional level side of the, uh, the Locha based business model, right? And how uh, we could help at uh, fostering a Locha inclusion inside Venezuela uh, with the infrastructure that Coinspray counts on today. Uh, so I, I believe I believe it is it, 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 we will eventually see like this light uh, light bulbs light light post right on the street with an IP68 box uh, with a Raspberry Pi inside it and then and a Pi Juice head uh, to include a battery inside that Raspberry Pi and so with a thirty five dollar computer and uh, how hardware that it will cost you like five hundred dollars all the way up to eight hundred dollars you will have a public access point to Bitcoin's and Lightning network. Right. And so that that's huge. I think uh, eventually if you want to do that, wherever you, it might be in the world, uh, unless you have like private municipalities, you have to deal with the state. Correct. That That's just the way it is. But I think it's very positive for Locha inside Venezuela specifically. Uh, Locha could, could eventually receive a bunch of credits in Bolivares to try to subsidize the fostering of this of this network. Because it needs to be, uh, just as Randy was saying, if we run the numbers, it will first be subsidized. It will first be subsidized I, cypher punks, I think, and people I, that actually have their own. I heard, I heard that the Venezuelan government is charging people taxes in cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin specifically. So I would prefer Bitcoins than believers. <laughs> but but the, the thing is that I, I, I also would prefer not to receive money that have been stolen from other people, uh, a, no, aka no. Uh, taxes. But the thing is, um, I, I basically, I think that, as you said, this is going to be a cypherpunk movement in the early days. Well, uh, it, Bitcoin is still in the early days. Um, and we are just uh, right now like watching one documentary about cypherpunks. Uh, from the recent magazine, yeah. so it's 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 going to take some time, but I think it has to be done from the bottom up, 
And, and the, the idea of that is that once the network has been set up by users, uh, it's going to be very difficult to shut it down. So the idea is that it works in a peer-to-peer -peer way first. And then if anyone wants to set up anything that makes use of it um, and don't uh, like block others because we have a way to, of blacklisting uh, um, nodes that are behaving um, maliciously. And this is basically done by the antenna itself. The Turpel device is smart enough to do this, uh, to tell if one of the way, uh, one of the paths they are using is being malicious and not delivering messages and not uh, relaying the messages, but uh, getting their messages relayed. And this, we have all these in place that we still have to work on. Um, and they, they, the idea is to deploy it in order to be able to to devil, to continue improving it. And the, the thing is that I, I, I think just like in Bitcoin, it does need a base of user first uh, that are uh, in favor of this continue being as decentralized as possible. Um, and I think this um, movement of setting up your own full node and connecting it uh, to a mesh network is going to be part of these uh, first nodes that are going to provide um, related messages and, and services to the users, the regular users that will be just walking around with an antenna and their phone because they need to communicate with others or pay someone. And the rest of the, of the people who are more tech it, more, pro more probably are going to have, um, are going to have their RPA nodes, which are computers more powerful. And um, the idea is that we do have to find out how to incentivize this mesh network. And the law 49 uh, that, Richard is working on. I think it doesn't need to have to go, to, to go that constraint in the amount of data being transmitted because as mentioned, uh, ham radio operators is something like hobby in, in everywhere. Basically that, those places that it is not a hobby, it is a, a life death situation which California, for example, is one of them, those where people rely on those hand radio operators sometimes when there are disasters or, 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 or fires. And they basically cannot operate anymore because the government of California is going against them and charging them and, and blocking them from, from, um, from, uh, from using this uh, alternative communication network freely. They want to tax them, they want to control them, they want to regulate them. So. I, I think that we, we do need this more private way of communicating, even if there are other things that already exist, like the higher operators, obviously in other countries are um, spread all, all, all over the country, but it's not as resilient and censorship resistant as we may be needing in the next few days. In the, uh, well, I meant to say the next few years, but most probably in the next few days, we are going to be needing uh, everywhere in the world too. So what I hear is that, um, uh, you know, Richard, you, you, you mentioned amateur radio um, you know, experts. I mean, is, would that be a viable option? I mean, to, you know, to, to, I, mean, I, I understand, you know, it's sort of in the early stages still, but uh, what are the priorities or, or is, um, sh should we, you know, be looking out for amateur or, or techies or, you know, cyberpunks? For example, in Venezuela, and build up a community, or what? What could be the strategy? What's the time frame here? Well, I mean, the original idea, sort of, actually, the original talk that got me interested in mesh networks for this kind of stuff was given by by Elaine Ao in 2017. Um, you probably have seen Elaine on Twitter, um, and she had, she and uh, Nick Zabo were proposing to use a low power, high frequency radio system to send Bitcoin transactions, and um, using that system, you know, in, in ideal conditions, you could get um, I think they were looking at, you know, hundreds or even a thousand miles. I mean, you really get a lot of propagation with ham radio. Of course, it's very low bandwidth, but fortunately, Bitcoin operates over low bandwidth. At least, you know, you can send a transaction or you can do a payment update over Lightning over these low bandwidth. So, so we actually have adapted sort of some of our early prototypes to work with ham radio, and we've done some initial tests with that. So 
um, if there were any ham operators that are listening to you, you right now, for example, um, who wanted to try it, we would love to give them our, you know, the source codes online. It's on GitHub. And we just really need two people who have the software on either end to try this out. And specifically what we're trying to show is that you can do, um, you can establish, you can create, open, and then update lightning channels over a ham radio system. Um, we've done it sort of locally in like a loopback fashion. We're just looking to demonstrate it in real life um, with, uh, you know, with two operators. So, so yeah, I mean, if, if there's anybody in Venezuela or, or anybody in Europe for that matter who wants to try it, I got my ham radio license myself a few weeks ago. So uh, I, I can't do it where I'm at right now, but I hope to give that a try myself on the other end. But, um, but it's ham radio is just another form of radio. I mean, what, what Randy and I are working on are, is in the um, ISM frequencies. Uh, it's, it's just lower power low, and it's slightly lower range, but it's essentially the same idea. So um, anytime you, it's, it, I think this also goes with the fundamental design of Bitcoin to be resource, very conservative with resources. So hard drive, memory, um, but also bandwidth. I mean, you can do a lot. You're not sending uh, huge ZK snarks all over the place, for example. You know, Bitcoin is only, you know, 200, 400 bytes for a transaction. Uh, we've done some analysis for about a thousand bytes. You can actually do a full um, channel update over lightning. So like that's including both directions of the communication. So this is like tiny, tiny bits of information compared to your normal internet bandwidth. Um, but because of that, it means you can, you, there's always this trade off between power, range and bandwidth. And because the bandwidth can stay low, you can also keep your power low um, and, and work over low bandwidth. So it really opens it up to anything you can imagine as far as communication. Um, which is yeah, that's, a way to make it resilient. That's what that's what we what we 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 are working with. Uh, we we took the the hard way. We we could have just used LoRa as we did in our first prototype prototypes, but we prefer to go to other available radio models that will enable us two hundred uh, kilobits per second, which is sometimes two hundred times the amount of 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 data you can send uh, with a LoRa model. And, and and the lot of protocol. So the, the the thing is that we we thought about this, and this is why I don't uh, I I'm not very excited about ham radio uh, 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 devices being used for this because of the low, low bandwidth. Because at the end we are currently in a um, like very um, uh, how you say this? this we we use. Uh, too many that too many that are uh, every day. So the thing is that we, we if we want to be able to keep up with how communication works today, we need to at least do the max that we can. So that's why we switch to this model radio models that we are using in our revision three, the third revision of our triple devices because we could get at least two hundred kilobits per second. But we are developing in a hardware that potentially in a year. Uh, because the model already exists, we haven't had the time or funds to uh, try them, but we could do two megabits per second. So if you could do two megabits per second in a one to two kilometers distance, um, you you don't need uh, too uh, like too many devices for covering a whole city, up to two megabits per second. So the thing is that the, you won't have any more the constraint of the low bandwidth in this. Uh, communication in the, the mesh communication network. So, I, I, I have also seen how the the ham radio operators themselves, as they are already registered and identified, and they have even to identify themselves when they are transmitting. I have seen them like not very willingly to pay attention to what we are trying to say because they have to comply to some regulations and they have to comply on what they transmit, the time of transmission the, of, of they are transmitting. And, and then they can't think back. Despite that, the people who have contacted us from European countries where they already have meetups working on major networks, they are ham operators, but they don't do it anymore. They do it as a hobby, but they don't want to base this uh, Bitcoin networks they are setting up in mesh. They don't want to do it over ham, their ham radio the, um, equipment. They want to make this a step ahead of just uh, working on something that is thinking more in the future. Because at, at the end, uh, even sending a picture that is going to be a way to 
to to, uh, to communicate, for example, th uh, things that are happening in one place or or, or the example of the Belarus that is currently happening, you will need to be able to send this picture and pictures right now with phones is, I don't know, 30, 40 megabits per, per picture, something like that. So we have to take into account the most people are going to communicate differently in the future. And we are developing you know, hardware that is going to, to at least provide you with uh, a communication uh, channel for the next a couple of years once we have uh, try the new radio models and, and expert have uh, joined us to help us get things uh, faster or better. And so that's uh, why we haven't looked too much into um, like very long range um, but low bandwidth communication, uh, radio communication ways, uh, because we also rely on the idea of many users. So you have enough hops and you have enough uh, path to deliver the data. So it's not only countries like Venezuela, it's good, like, you know, any potential country like Iran. I mean, I'm gonna definitely forward this, this um, uh, Zia, whom we talked to yesterday, is a Bitcoiner, you know, <laughs> very prominent one. So uh, could that be like a, like an option to, to you know, test this in, in different countries? if? You know, if there are people like amateur, like Richard mentioned, like amateur radio people, so we, we can test this yeah. out. I mean, the nice thing about amateur radio people, like, I mean, Randy mentioned that there are people who have expressed interest in what he's doing too. These people are really sort of at the forefront of experimentation with radio. Um, now, and because they have this license that is an amateur license, they're able to try different frequencies. They can try more power. Um, I mean, both uh, Randy, what he's working on and what I'm working on are sort of in this unlicensed spectrum. I, I assume, Randy, that's what you're doing. It's in an unlicensed region so that um, people don't have to have a ham radio license to use these radios. And your cell phones are a little bit different. Your cell phones are using spectrum that's licensed and sold by the government to these companies. So that's a whole different model. Um, but one, one thing I think that I think is important is that there are certain laws of physics that come into play when you're dealing with radio. And this is, this is sort of, there's things that you can't get for free. I mean, you can't have both low power usage, long distance and high bandwidth. It's just, those are, those are like fundamental conflicting things. I mean, just take power versus range. It, literally power and range are related, you know, because that's how much you know, vibrate your antenna. You know, it's, it's how much wattage you're putting out in the air. Um, so I, I actually think my focus has been more on how do you do things with less bandwidth because I would rather be conservative with the bandwidth and optimize for low power and high range. But I, one place I think we definitely all agree is that Wi-Fi won't do it. You know, Wi-Fi makes a bad trade-off. It's very high bandwidth, but it's such low range that it doesn't really give you privacy and it doesn't really give you the ability to create a connected mesh. Um, you would need basically everybody, you know, you would need like 10X or 100X more nodes in a particular area to create a mesh. If you remember Fire Chat, that was uh, during the Hong Kong, Revol uh, Hong Kong protests, I think in the 90s. And they used Bluetooth, which is even worse than Wi-Fi. It's low bandwidth and it's low range. Um, and when you're in a, you know, a crowded situation, they could use it, but um, there's no way a, a Bluetooth mesh network could have really caught on. But where the thing that Randy is working on and what I'm working on have like in the, in, the in the sort of realm of kilometers of range, which means that for a city, you can actually build a connected, a fully connected mesh network with a fairly low number. I mean, this is like, just to give you an idea, this is a Gotenna mesh. Mm -hmm. it's, it'll last power-wise for about a day and have a couple of kilometers or so of, of range. So you might need, you know, depending on how much area and where you're, you know, what the conditions are, um, you might need just a handful of those to cover a region if people are running them and if people are, you know, keeping them powered on and everything. So anyway, that's why I think my... The zero start problem is the problem I'm, is I think a very fundamental problem. And that's how do you get people to run them? Because it, once you get a lot of people running them, the network is useful and people want to run them. It's when it's early and people aren't running them, you need to kind of bootstrap that network to get that critical mass so that people can turn it on and actually get a message across. It's again, so, coming back to educational problem, <laughs> like in Bitcoin, like yeah, we need to education. educate people, right? But yeah. if the need is there, if the pain point is there, like in Venezuela, yeah. Turkey, Iran, anywhere, you know, where there's sanctions and, and, and surveillance and oppressive regimes, I mean, it's, yeah. it's crazy, you know? 
Yeah, and I think open source hardware is a great idea because that also gets around these these problems with sanctions. Or you know, if I if I actually talked to a guy from Turkey and I, I was talking about the Gotenna mesh and I was like, can we get you some of these Gotenna meshes? And he said, no, you really can't because every piece of communication hardware that comes into Turkey is authorized by a special agency and they don't allow peer to peer communication. It's and he worked for like a the radio state like one of the radio big broadcasters there and he knew all the regulations and he said. They don't allow peer-to-peer, even like walkie-talkies, they don't allow those. Um, so that's where I open hardware is pretty important. Um, but, but, you know, yeah, so- let's, let's send a bunch of uh, durable devices there. We can send a drone <laughs> next to the border like we are planning to do in Venezuela too. You just send them with a, a lot of them. globes yeah. so that they just drop them there. Yeah, yeah. You, we, can, oh, we oh, can do that. We can put a small balloon and let them just... <laughs> Try uh, the farthest you can, and then yes, now we're someone just need to get it and, and get it blocked. Yeah, that's yeah. that's that how that's how we are going to do it in Venezuela. I don't I don't have any intention of, talk, of talking to the regulators there to get the devices to allow the devices to go in. I had myself a lot of issues getting the uh, uh, the Go Ten devices in Spain, which is not. Uh, your favorite uh, authoritarian country just yet. And the, the thing is that the I, it took me like a couple of months and several hundred of dollars paying the borders in for them to to release the devices that they want me to specify what I was going to use them for. I've never used them. Uh, we, we had this conversation. I, I was not able to connect the two uh, ones I uh, unboxed it. So I, uh, the other ones I given away, I give I give them away to the developers so they could uh, work uh, uh, and take a look on them. But the thing is that that is even for people in European countries, it's difficult to get devices that are meant to be to communicate with others in a peer-to-peer manner. So uh, this is why it is so important for us that the not only the protocol and the code and the mobile app are open source, but also the hardware itself is open source. So if you are not capable of buying the devices from uh, our company that is going to sell them, um, we are going to teach you how you can build those devices yourself with all the shell parts that you can buy on the internet. You can currently build a development kit so you can uh, start uh, playing with it it doesn't have a, a long range because it's only for development. It's, it's like two rooms distance. Uh, but the ones that we are doing for development, which are the, the triple dev kits, uh, are basically going to be the end user uh, product, but without the case. Because thanks to regulation, we cannot sell the devices in a case. Uh, we have to first go through a lot of uh, uh, regulations and things like that that will enable us to sell the device in a, inside a case with a battery. So we're going to basically sell the devices as uh, you can see here. This is basically the device uh, with all the board and all the components and you can see them. So we're going to sell the devices this way, just like a, a Raspberry Pi, you, when you buy it on the internet, it doesn't have anything, not even a case. You have to buy the case separately. So this, this way it, it's going to be more attractive obviously for gigs and and makers but it's going to enable you to start playing with it or even make your own if if you know how to order the boards and place the the components yourself you you are capable of welding them you will be able to do it because we are going to open source the way that uh, you can build your own tool devices too all right um I, I really got an inspiration now for for, the, for our film project <laughs> how to visualize like what is what is really possible with this technology, um, with the new structures. Um, before we wrap up, yeah, I mean, uh, are there any important points we've missed, like um, roadmap or priorities, urgencies, or or what do you need, uh, Randy? Is is there anything you you need maybe besides investors? <laughs> Yeah, well, besides investors, can you, you can also uh, donate or make a pre-order of the devices uh, at locha.io. So that helps us continue making the open source software and open source hardware. And so anything that can uh, contribute to what we are doing 
obviously help, but we also need help on this kind of of activities that, that you do for educating people uh, or or this that's this ca- discussions that get us get us connected to each other on um, how we can collaborate with each other to to get this um, to everyone who actually need it. Yeah, that was the initial idea to bring you guys together so you know we can create potential synergies and uh, you know exchange some creative ideas or uh, whatever is needed. So um, yeah, Richard, I'm going to t- uh, start with you. Any final thoughts or where people can find you? Or vision? Sure, sure. You can uh, you can find us at uh, at Global Mesh Labs on Twitter. Um, GlobalMeshLabs.org is our website. Uh, we're really actually in a mode now where we're looking for testers. So if you want to be if you want to try out uh, being a gateway, we're working on a project right now to allow internet gateways over the mesh so that people can sort of like our TX10 project to to do that, but it's an expanded version of that. So we're looking for testers for that and eventually for our Lot49 software, which I'm currently developing. So that'll be a mobile app that'll allow people to do um, these light, these uh, incentivized networked uh, messaging over over a mobile phone. So anybody who's interested in that, please uh, get on our Telegram or or drop us an email on Twitter and we'll get you signed up for that. Um, Yeah, so we're, I mean, we've built our hardware, so we're not looking for money for that. We're really just looking for people to help contribute to the open source software, either as a developer or as a tester or somebody to give us feedback on the application. So anybody who's interested in this stuff should definitely get in touch. But uh, yeah, thanks. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. Alessandro, if I thought. Uh, I well, it was totally fun meeting you guys. Uh, in the end, this is this is what we do. A bunch of badass Bitcoiners <laughs> reinventing a, a small part of the globe, right? Uh, I did have one last question for Randy, and that's regarding just um, like the reality of where we come from, because this side of the world actually, t- at least today, craves for dollars more than Bitcoin, right? And so I, I had this question now that I, I know that they've been operating with a uh, sea lighting uh, at, at Locha. If you guys have uh, some plans on integrating the liquid network as well into your mesh network, because... Uh, I think that eventually it could be highly positive for our continent and other our, other parts of the world, not only providing exposure to people with this uh, censorship resistant network to Bitcoin, but also to uh, dollar tether and stable coins, for example, which are a very popular topic even on this side of the world right now. Thanks. Well, I I think that people used to have in Venezuela. Um, Several years ago, and 10 years ago, well, 10, eight years ago, when I started talking about Bitcoin in Venezuela, the wrong idea of uh, liking too much the Bolivar, and they currently have the wrong idea of liking too much the dollar. So um, that's something that is going to be difficult to change, but it has taken them pain and, and suffering to understand that the Bolivar uh, is nothing they sh- should be uh, loving at all. And they have found out by themselves that the dollar is better than the Bolivar. And I hope that they, uh, with the help of education, also find out that Bitcoin is way better for them and for their families and for the economy than the dollar itself. So um, we already work with uh, the Blockstream uh, liquid team and we also work with the, um, we, ha- we have been in touch with the satellite, uh, blockchain satellite team too, um, the, bl- the green wallet team and aqua team right now. Always, oh, that's a pretty cool name. It's the aqua team, but it's not the, the, the other aqua team. So the aqua wallet, uh, we are also in touch with them. And I have tried out the liquid. And the great thing about Locha Mesh is that they don't have to do anything for the for the liquid network to work in a, in the Locha Mesh because we are doing it in a way we are doing it in a way that it works out of the box. You just need to connect your computer that currently have that currently is running the the liquid uh, node, and it's going to be capable of listening and providing others with the information of, of that network too, uh, right away. So 
uh, we are going obviously to to knock the door with it when we try it out ourselves so they can find out that it's possible and um, but i we, we what we want with this uh with everyone is to show them that we are doing something not only for bitcoin and we are doing it also for communications and we are doing also this for data so we want people to understand that the more people use that that use the locha mesh the better that is going to be Thank, thank you, man. I do think that it will be better eventually at having a decentralized internet saver, sa service provider than just AT&T in the U.S., for example. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really enjoyed this talk and learned so much. I mean, even though I'm not technical, but um, I, I, I'm still able to follow, you know, the, uh, the concept of what you're talking about. Um, so, uh, guys, thank you so much. Um, I hope you can repeat this maybe in the near future with other uh, Bitcoiners or um, you know people who can complement also you and, and help you in a, in this in this uh, testing phase, uh, which is urgently needed. Um, so, yeah, appreciate for for coming on the show and have a good thank one. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. Thanks for organizing it, Kevin. Really it, appreciate that. Thank you very much, buddy. So I hope you all have a good one. See you all. Yep. Bye. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So how'd you like this amazing, fast, mind-boggling talk with Alessandro Cesera, Richard Myers, and Randy Brito? So if you know anybody who can, you know, uh, be of any help or assistance to, you know, for, for the test phase, for, you know, whether it's amateur, radio experts, techies you know cyberpunks people who know you know what they're doing and want to test it it's like you know it's like in bitcoin it's all about education it's about you know uh, uh educating people like about the potential the real transformational potential and <laughs> power of this technology and once we have that you know not only millions but billions of people will be using this kind of technology independent of the internet and power grid uh, would it be whatever you know uh long range or you know long low bandwidth uh, s small power whatever that is it's going to help people finally free themselves from the shackles of slavery from censorship of oppression surveillance so you know we're gonna increase privacy we're going to increase uh exponentially uh censorship resistant uh transactions so all these technologies are coming at a rate of, of, of speed that is unfathomable and it's going to happen. It's going to happen uh, whether it's going to be, you know, it's going to take days, weeks, months or maybe a few years, but it's going to happen. You know, nothing is going to stop Bitcoin and all its, uh, you know, complementary technologies which are urgently needed. So if you are in, you know, any other of, of those countries where there, you know, sanctions, embargoes, uh, censorship, surveillance, oppression, you know, like in Iran uh, or, or poor, you know, poverty, you know, and, and and all these, you know, suffering and pain, so we can we can we can solve this, all right? But we can we we need to connect. We need to do this together. So again, if you love this talk, please, um, if you love this episode, please give it a like, share, retweet. Uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel, to my podcast platform. If you have any questions, and if you or if you want to contribute to our film project, we want to you know really bring people, bring humanity, the bigger picture. Uh, first of all, in a trailer, and then in a film production, what it means you know to be in a Bitcoin rooted economy, in a free private city, to be you know in total freedom. What does it mean? What what's you know what is the technology or innovation behind it? The evolution behind it. So thank you so much again for your support. My email address is hello at the totalconnector.com. Make sure you follow me and all my guests on Twitter, Alessandro Cesera, Richard Myers, Randy Brito. And again, uh, if you wanna you know, do something about it, if you wanna you know, live in a really beautiful world, the, the, the time is now because uh, it's getting worse and worse on day to day. Uh, and with it, we talk about the central banks, the governments, or unelected uh, centralized institutions. Now is the time for evolution. We have no time for revolution. So thank you again, and talk to you soon.